Well, good evening everyone and thanks for joining us again for our evening devotions. Um, I want to continue on from last night looking at Psalm 1 and so I'm going to read that again now. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Yesterday I spoke about how Psalm 1 is neither a worship song nor a prayer, but is a commentary on life that seeks to get us ready to enter the Psalms and learn from them. I want firstly to just underline that point, for we tend to categorise the Psalms as prayers set to music, and that shapes how we read them and what we think about them. It's clear from Psalm 1 that the Psalms are Torah They are the instruction in the ways of God in the same way that the law and the prophets are Torah. And one of the things that they instruct us in, one of the things that they teach us, is how to pray. In fact, as Eugene Peterson has written, the best school of prayer continues to be the Psalms. Tonight I want to drill down a little bit on one of the key aspects of the instruction of this Psalm because we all too easily get it wrong. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of being in a church service and sensing that God was speaking to you. I mean really speaking to you, to you and no one else. I vividly remember such a time. I used to manage a Christian bookshop and every year I would attend the Christian booksellers convention. In the late 80s and 90s it was held in the Norbreck Castle Hotel in Blackpool, a large but tired and slightly run down hotel in a town that bereft of crowds and lights was equally tired and run down looking. Every year they wheeled in a speaker to lead some early morning Bible studies um, but to be honest not a lot of people went to them. We were uh, in a cheap hotel quite a bit away from the Norbreck, but my colleague wanted to attend the Bible studies because uh, she had read uh, some books by this particular speaker and uh, wanted to hear him, him preach. So off we went, and the usual small crowd was there the first morning. But by the last morning, it was standing room only. The speaker was Ron Dunn. And he was preaching through the first four verses of Psalm 37. It was a very strange experience to be in a room of about 600 people and feel like there was no one there but Ron Dunn and me. And he was telling me something that God wanted me to know. And I absolutely knew it with every fibre of my being. It was as if he'd been reading my thoughts and looking into my life with a spy cam. I've never forgotten about it. At the time he was speaking, I kept thinking, how does he know about me? Most importantly, I guess, it was after this that my relationship with God began to change. As that word that was so clearly for me and nobody else in the room worked its way into my life, thereby changing my relationship with God and with other people. It's one of those experiences that you have that's really difficult to explain or or describe. You can state the facts, but the emotional and spiritual aspects of it are really impossible to adequately express. And now you're all just wondering what it was he said. I think actually I've still got the cassette somewhere, and I know that some of you are old enough to know what a cassette is. I only tell this story because it illustrates a key point from the psalm and one that we are very apt to get wrong and that concerns the nature of the psalms as instruction in the ways of God and their meditation on them. There are two words used in the psalm that it's profitable for us to explore the meaning of. Firstly, the word Torah 
which as I've already said is most commonly translated as law, but it generally means instruction, like the wise advice a father would give to his children. The noun Torah comes from the Hifl transitive form of the verb Yara, and that means to throw something or to shoot an arrow so that it hits its target. Peterson puts it this way, the word that hits its mark is Torah. In living speech, words are javelins hurled from one mind to another. And God's word has this aimed, intentional, personal nature. When we are spoken to this way, piercingly and penetratingly, we're not the same. These words get inside us and work their meaning in us. The Psalms and indeed the whole of Scripture is instruction, but not in the sense of a set of instructions on how to build an Ikea bookcase. The instruction of Scripture is not an intellectual exercise designed to increase our knowledge. As Peterson says, it's not a reference book we pull off the shelf when we want information. It is instruction that is intended to pierce our hearts and work its way into our lives and effect the change that we need to be able to walk in the ways of God. One of the best modern books on prayer is Prayer Experiencing All in Intimacy with God by Tim Keller. And he writes in there, We must not settle for an informed mind without an engaged heart. God's words are words that we are meant to take in, to take to heart because they are designed to shape new life in us. Secondly, the word meditate is haga. It doesn't mean, as we might suppose, to simply read and think about something. Rather, it means to mutter. Isaiah uses the word to describe the low, growling satisfaction of a lion over its prey. Elsewhere in the Psalms, the word does carry the meaning of pondering and questioning what is written in order to understand it, to ask of yourself what am I needing to do in light of this word? Am I living in light of this word? What needs to happen? What needs to change? But here the sense is more about learning the word. In ancient times, scripture was recited aloud from memory. It was memorised by a constant murmuring of the words until they worked their way into the heart and mind. In fact, the word itself that's used is onomatopoeic. It sounds like the thing it's describing, a muttering, a murmuring. Keller writes, There is no better way to meditate on a verse and to draw out all the aspects, implications and richness of its meaning than to memorise it. The Psalms are written in part to teach us how to pray. And prayer begins with being pierced by Torah and meditating upon that Torah, murmuring it, muttering it, speaking it over and over and over until the words resonate in our hearts, until the words pierce us, until the words are so fixed in our minds that we know them by heart. I used to know someone who had a friend who had memorized the book of Romans and as he went out on a walk, he would recite the book of Romans to himself as he walked. And he knew where he was on his walk, depending on which chapter and verse in Romans he was at. That's kind of what's in mind here. That we would meditate on the scripture, that we would mutter it, that we would speak it, that we'd feel the shape and form of the words and remember them. The Psalms are written to teach us to pray. Prayer begins by being pierced by Torah, by letting the word of God hit its mark in our lives and then meditating on it, memorising it. And so if, like me, you want to have a deeper experience of God in prayer, this is where we must begin. Thanks for listening.